So good morning, Charged Up Studio listeners, and welcome back to another episode where you get charged up for success. I'm Dana Olivo, your host and CEO of Market Atomy LLC. Now, there have been many times I've connected with prospects and even clients who have chosen the franchising or licensing methodology for getting into business. Well, today, we have a very special guest who specializes in franchising, Diane Ploys. She has joined us from Franchise, and she's going to talk to us about the franchise industry and what we can uh, expect when it comes to looking at franchising as our business methodology. So let's all give a very warm, charged up welcome to Diane Ploys. Thank you, Dana. So happy to be here today and chat about all things franchising. No, definitely. I'm excited to, to finally get you on. So since 2004, Diane has matched hundreds of entrepreneurs with their perfect fit franchise opportunity while successfully guiding them to avoid rookie mistakes at no cost to her clients. As a result, they are creating wealth, making an impact in their marketplace and enjoying the systems already in place to accelerate their path to success. So Diane, as stated, I'm really excited to have you here with us. Uh, there's a lot of benefits that, that come with franchising, and then there's a lot of disadvantages that come with franchising. So we're going to talk a little bit more about all of this. So before we get started, can you kind of give us a little bit of background about who Diane is, how she got involved in franchising, et cetera. Sure. I am basically a farm girl from Wisconsin. When I grew up, I did not know a lot of women in business. I was very active in 4-H. There was a 4-H leader, and I very much liked what she did. So I went to college, and my original degree was home economics, which doesn't even exist anymore. Along the way, I picked up a secondary degree of communication, so I had the dual degree. But it allowed me to go to college, to graduate, to have a good couple of first jobs, and to get into the business world. I was in advertising and marketing. And when we moved to California for my husband's job, I answered one ad in the newspaper for a marketing assistant for a franchise development company. Now, I didn't know franchising, but I had those transferable skills. So I was hired and that opened up the door to franchising. Later on, I worked for a franchise company as the director of franchising. So I worked on the corporate side. Unfortunately, like many of the people I work with, I was very surprised and shocked when I was downsized as part of senior management. And two of the people that I had worked with had been invited to join Fran Choice as independent franchise consultants. And they said, oh, Diane, you would love it here because you're working with great people. And we work with this whole range of companies so you don't have to fit a square peg in a round hole, so to speak. And I was also invited, that was 17 years ago. So I've been doing this franchise matchmaking where I match good people with good businesses that whole time. Wow. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's an exciting industry to get into. And you are dealing with a lot of different um, types of businesses. Now, in my experience, first of all, when you talked about home ec, I can remember <laughs> home ec in high school or in 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 uh, middle school I think it was not in high school in middle school whereas we learned how to bake and do laundry and <laughs> things like that but 4-H to me uh, was what I remember was more on the farm side of things which is where you're from raising yeah. animals you know and, and things like that so that's a long ways from the franchise side of things and um, women entrepreneurship, 
<laughs> it, it is a long way. And yet my dad, being a dairy farmer, had his own business. He very much enjoyed it. He loved seeing the results of his hard work and effort. He was named the Farmer of the Year one year. And we would have school buses come out of the city kids to see a dairy farm. And when they were done with the tour, all the kids would get Dixie cups of ice cream and whatever was left was, was left for us, which I thought was fabulous. <laughs> but I think it was that growing up with my family and seeing them having that control, working with neighbors, sharing some equipment, helping each other out, but seeing the fruits of their labor and, and building and growing and, and many respects, leaving a legacy. Yes, and legacy is critical there. So we're all familiar with franchises in the sense of like McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's and, you know, and things like that, you know, but that's not the, the, the crux of um, uh, franchising, is it? There's, there's many, many other types of franchises, right? Talk you're about that a little bit. Yes, you're absolutely correct. There are many other options. We tend to think of the fast food restaurants because they're by the side of the road and they've got that flashing sign, but there is much more to franchising than just fast food and French fries. So there are many, many different industries. It could be fitness, it could be senior care, massage studios, nail salons, hair salons. There's a lot of service-based businesses, particularly related to residential, and they have done extremely well during this pandemic, this past 18 months. And that could be starting from the top of the house, it could be roofing, it could be gutter cleaning, insulation, irrigation, lawn care, pool care, pet care, painting, handyman, electrical, HVAC, plumbing, window coverings, flooring, uh, emergency services, IT, uh, there is a, a, a staffing, there is a very, very long list. No, it's that definitely, and I want to get into um, getting more information from you on what's involved in getting involved in a franchise or even building a franchise, but first, let's talk about who is it that's usually drawn to franchising? Well, I've actually identified five categories of people that I work with that are drawn to franchising. And the first group are the people that are 50 plus and many times they've been downsized. They have great skills. They don't know that they want to go back to the corporate world and possibly be downsized again in another three to five years. So they look at a franchise many times right along with the job to learn about it and say, gee, I could do this. I've got this playbook now. So that's a very good option for them. I also work with people who are employed, but what I call nervous. So they've got the good job, but they're in an industry that's downsizing or a department and they want to have a safety net. So they do what's called a manager run business. So they keep their job, but they build a business on the side that a manager runs. Usually they'll open up the first unit or location the first year, the second unit, the second year, the third unit, the third year. And by that time they're cash flowing nicely. And they then can be really in that catbird seat and say, do I want to continue with the job? Or do I want to now transition into my own business and continue to grow and scale it? So that's another category, if you will, of person that I work with. Related to that, I work with people who have taken time off from work. And they tend to be women who have cared for family or sometimes elderly parents. They've got great skills. They've left good positions behind. And now when they look at going back, they're less excited about that. So when they discover franchising and some of the flexibility and control they can have, they say, yes, count me in. I'd like to sign the front of the check rather than the back of the check. Um, the fourth category would be veterans and franchise companies love veterans because if you think about it, they're used to following systems and procedures. They usually have great management experience. 
And many times franchise companies will give veterans a discount off the franchise fee and they tend to outperform as a group other franchisees. So they're very welcomed. And then the last type of person I work with, I call the plug and play entrepreneur. They wanna work for themselves, they're salt of the earth, they're good people, but they don't have that big idea. They say, give me that playbook, give me that toolbox and let me go, let me work. So that gives you some idea of the people that I work with. Right. And I would imagine with, with what we've been going through the last 20, 24 months, um, it's opened up the franchise industry quite a bit. There are a lot more people are looking uh, who have been displaced or just dis decided they're not going back to work. They've been able to save up some money because they've been sitting at home, working from home, you know, and things like that. And they don't have the overhead that they have been having and they've saved up money and now they're ready to start, you know, thinking about, okay, you know, what am I going to do now? You're absolutely right. A lot of these folks now recognize that they have options and choices. And not everyone wants to go back to the office. Some of them have had a taste of a little bit more of flexibility and they recognize there are more possibilities out there. So yes, a lot more people are looking at it. And we see that with the small business administration, more people are taking out loans and they're getting started with businesses. So they've never been busier, partly because money is available and it's pretty reasonably priced. So let's talk about um, the differences in franchises, because I know with the clients that I've worked with, there are some franchises that are pretty strict like McDonald's and they have systems and things like that. And then there are some like the, the home health care, you know, those type that aren't as strict. You still have to treat that as though you have to come up with your own systems, your own methodologies to run your business. What you're doing is you're basically, you are, you know, purchasing this franchise or this licensing capabilities, uh, it's the brand you're purchasing is basically what it is. Well, you're really purchasing the whole system, the training, the infrastructure, the vendor relationships, all of that. So they've got that program, that blueprint laid out for you. What you're going to be doing is you're going to be executing it. You're going to be hiring the people, training them, managing them, developing the relationships probably being involved in the community, uh, deciding on advertising and marketing strategies, watching the financials, watching the cash flow. Right, right. But then there are those, you know, I know that we've run into a few, I've run into a few of the smaller franchise where, you know, yes, you've got the training and things like that. But when it comes to marketing, there's no contributions, there's no real you know, uh, benefit on the marketing side or anything like that, you have to figure that out for yourself. Okay. Well, certainly some of the smaller franchise companies won't have a national ad fund. So it might say in their agreement when they hit X number of units, for example, when they hit 100 or 500 units, then a national ad fund will kick in. Usually they'll have the prepared ads. They'll have the digital advertising ready for you so that again, you can implement it. And they'll have, recommend, they'll have recommendations for you. And hopefully people will follow those recommendations. Not everyone does. And, and with the smaller franchises, um, certainly they don't have nearly the brand recognition yet because they don't have as many locations open and they probably haven't been around that long yet. So give them a little more time. And speaking of that, let's talk a little bit about if you have a business and you want to franchise that business, what are some of the, the, the legalities or the requirements that are, are needed to be in place for you to be able to franchise? Like I've heard before that you have to have like five years of systems and methodologies in place, you know, and, and things like that. What... Uh, First yeah. of all, that is not my specialty, but I can give just a few general comments. Whenever people are looking at a franchise, they're looking for something that's predictable. So if you're starting, a, if you want to start a franchise, you would look at your existing business. 
do you have all the training in place so that if you hired Joe or Jane Average, could Joe or Jane Average take your training and everything that you've done and operate it? So that would be part of the start. And then are Joe and Jane getting that replicatable results? Are they getting the same revenue that you're getting? And if you're seeing that, those are good indicators. And then they may want to talk with a franchise attorney or companies that specialize in developing franchises. And, and, and I had heard that you, you really should have some kind of uh, record as far as more than just one place too. You want to be able to show that you have been able to duplicate this process, this franchise process in multiple locations, you know, that type deal. Sure. So. Again, if you think of the person, so if you're going to be that potential franchisee and you're going to be writing out a check, you want to make sure that the system is sound and, and it may be new and you go, I, I know these people, I like these people, I trust these people but you wanna make sure that everything is in place so that you too can be successful. Okay, okay. So talk to me a little bit about what an artisan is. Sure, an artisan might be another name for an owner operator. So they like to be involved in the business. They want to be hands-on in the business and they will run it. They may hire people, they may not. And sometimes I talk with people and they say, gee, I managed 25 people, but I've made it to that corporate office. Now I would like something very simple. I would like to be involved hands-on. I want to give that customer support and interaction. If you can find me a business that I can do, let's look at that. Okay, and an executive model is? Sure, an executive model would be where you're managing the business. So you're hiring the technicians. So that could be the handyman, it could be the painters, it could be the people who are doing the residential cleaning, it could be the caregivers for a senior care franchise. So let's just take senior care. That's an executive model. You're going to be involved in the community. You're going to build those relationships with the hospitals and those resources. You're gonna be hiring and growing a staff. So you're not the person who is that caregiver, but you're hiring the caregivers and overseeing and managing them. Right, right. And, th and that's what I've been involved in is, is the individuals who are hiring these people and they're just managing the teams as far as that's concerned. Okay, so kind of shed some light on some of the assumptions that people make about franchises and what are some of the myths that you want to dispel? Sure. Well, one myth is that you need a million dollars, that it's very expensive. And again, we tend to think of McDonald's, which is a large investment. But if we're looking at a business that's service-based that could run out of a home office or a vehicle or even executive suite, that's a lot more reasonable to get into than having to have a space on Main and Main, that intersection, which is very pricey, or you're going to arm wrestle for a spot with Starbucks. Um, so uh, people can get in for a reasonable investment. Uh, many times they will finance a balance or finance a business. They will talk to the SBA, they'll look at loans. Sometimes people will use home equity. Many times people use retirement funds, which you can use. When you roll it into your business, it's not something that you can do yourself. Companies specialize in that, but then you're starting with equity funding rather than debt funding. And there's no penalty for that. And there are actually some tax advantages. So yeah. I encourage people to become educated on their options. So usually a franchise company will want you to have a certain net worth and liquidity and come to the table with about 30% liquid and finance the balance. Okay. Okay. You know, this is basically, okay. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons. Let's be honest here. The pros and cons between franchising and a self-start business. Sure. Well, to me, the, the pros are you've got a lot of things figured out. You've got someone who has gone down the road further right. and faster and they said, oh my gosh, we made this mistake, don't make this mistake. And so they fine tune things for you and they're very proud of what they've done. 
and they say, here, here you can do this and you can be successful. So having the systems, the infrastructure in place is huge. Also, the network of other franchisees. Many times it's a very close network and they become friends, they vacation together, we all go to conferences and fly out the week early or stay the week after. So there's a great deal of camaraderie. And many times when people leave a corporate world and I'm being stereotypical here, sometimes it can be that dog eat dog environment. And they're not used to people actually helping. But if you and I were both franchisees, I could help you and you can succeed and I can succeed. It doesn't have to be at the expense of one or the other. Both of our businesses can rise. So those are some of the advantages. Some of the disadvantages is there is a franchise fee because there's value attached and there is an investment. It has a system. So if you're a McDonald's franchisee, uh, you shouldn't serve tacos on Tuesdays. They have a, a menu. You might be selected to test market a product, but that would come then from the home office. And a lot of those good ideas start with franchisees but they do have an infrastructure they want you to follow. Uh, there's a agreement that you need to sign called the franchise disclosure document, the legal document. Um, so that is involved. And there is some risk. So a franchise is really a risk mitigation strategy, but there still is some risk. There aren't any guarantees. So you can't just write out a check and say, okay, I'm going to be this great business owner and let the money roll in. It doesn't work that way. It's kind of like when you join the gym, you actually have to go and you have to lift some weights and you have to participate. And likewise with the franchise. And, and that's exactly it. You know, it's still a business, no matter whether it's a franchise or your own business or a licensed arrangement or whatever, it's still a business and you still have to treat it like a business. So exactly. Let's get back to the fees and things like that. Now, I know that there's a there's an initial fee a lot of times for buying into the franchise, but then is there a revenue share fee as well? Usually there is a royalty and most of the time it's a percentage and that will all be spelled out. There are a few companies that will do a flat monthly fee and there are a couple of companies that will include fee in the product, but most of the time it's a royalty. And again, you look at that and, and no one likes paying fees, but if you're getting enough value for it and you say, you know, I couldn't do this on my own or they're providing a call center or they've got a spokesperson or they're developing this new program, you look at it and you say, this is great. You know, I contributed towards that with my royalty and I got tremendous value. So that's why people continue to renew and that's why people go into franchises is they see that value. And that's what, and that's what a lot of uh, these new franchisees need to, or people considering going into franchising need to consider is the fact that by franchising, you are cutting your overhead costs considerably marketing costs, you know, and, and um, things like that. And then places like McDonald's, you know, and stuff like that, they help find the, the, the locations, the ideal locations. They do a lot of the research up front that you would have to pay for. So there are a lot of benefits to the franchising side of things. Um, there are some, you know, some, some not so pleasant benefits <laughs> well there are downfalls. yeah let's Just call it there are some restrictions that you yeah. need to, to follow and yeah. if you're that mcdonald's franchisee and your bathrooms are dirty and your parking lot has a lot of trash in it that's going to affect neighboring franchisees so they're going to say sh shape up here yeah. which they should because that could impact your business yeah and then if you look um you know, uh, I know down here, okay, we've got, uh, what is it, racetrack and Wawa, okay? And it never seems to fail. Every time there's a racetrack that opens up, the Wawa is right across the street or vice versa, okay? And anytime a McDonald's would open up, a Burger King would be not far down the street or Wendy's or something like that. 
who follows who here? <laughs> As, I mean, basically what they're doing is they are um, uh, basically taking advantage of the research that's already be, been done by, you know, Certainly, that is a strategy of some of the companies. Yes. And with most franchise companies, again, if we talk other than fast food, many times the franchise companies will work with you on finding that best location. And you're going to be local, so you have certain advantages of, of being uh, having the feet in the street, if you will, but they're also going to usually provide some advice and some insight and help with negotiating that lease, those types of things, which again is very important. So let's talk a little bit about veterans. Now we talked earlier and you said that franchise um, opportunities or companies, they really seek out these veterans. Explain why veterans are so important to franchisees or franchisors. Sure. Again, if you if you think of someone who has served our country, first of all, they want to say thank you for your service, but they are used to following systems and usually they have managed people. So they are used to that interaction. They are decision makers, usually very good with customer service. Um, and they've got maybe more of an entrepreneurial spirit. Not every veteran feels comfortable in the civilian world and they would like to have their own business, but again, with a bit of that safety net. So it's, it's a very nice match. I would imagine for the vet as well, because the vet gets into a system that they feel comfortable with being told what to do, you know, and things like that. It, well, exactly. And again, they can contribute as well, but there is um, that comfort level of knowing there's value there and they're not on their own. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. So we talked earlier about um, the COVID pandemic and what's happened within the franchising industry um, as far as like displaced workers and everything. How has it also affected the franchise industry as far as, you know, we see a lot of these smaller companies closing down, especially on the restaurant side, you know, or losing, you know, um, business considerably because of the shutdown. So how has it affected the franchise industry? Certainly with restaurants that has had a major effect. And a lot of times they've had to look at their menus and revise their menus or put the focus on takeout or to go or the drive through. But again, most people getting into a business don't necessarily start with fast food because it's a higher investment. Uh, usually people look at the hours that are required and say, gee, you know, I'd like to have more of a life or something that's a little more family friendly. So again, if we look at some of the other options available, they don't necessarily make the news and many times they have done well, but the franchise companies are not touting that because it has been a very difficult time and that would not be appropriate. So many of the service-based businesses, the handyman businesses, the painting franchises, they have had their very best year by a lot. I would imagine but yeah. Um, again, because people are home, they recognize that they would like things done. They don't have the skills. They don't have the tools. They don't have the time. They would like it done, but they want it done by someone who's that they know is professional and going to show up on time, et cetera. So those businesses have actually thrived. And I have had a number of people. So the past couple of weeks, I've been calling some of my past placements. And I think this past year, I've had four people that I've placed that have bought second territories. So I think that gives you some indication that they're, that they're doing well and that there is opportunity out there. Um, and, and then if you're in a franchise and you decide or you come to the realization, this isn't for me, you know, you bought into it or whatever, 
how hard is it to get out of the franchise industry? Do you have to sell the business yourself? Um, can you work with the franchisor? Will they help to sell it? You know, things like that. Sure. Well, first of all, when people are looking at a franchise, we call that time the franchise investigation time. So you're going to learn a lot from the franchise company. They're going to have webinars. They're going to talk about unit economics, about the investment, the different revenue streams. They're going to talk about the advertising, the marketing, the IT platform, their training, their support. They're going to go through the legal documents. And when you know the basics, then they will give you the green light to talk to existing franchisees. And that's called validation. So you get to talk with people who are currently running the business or anyone that has been in there as well. And you can ask them some of the hard questions. And how long did it take you, Bob, to hit break even? Or what did you invest, Jane? Or what has been the biggest learning for you, Sam? So you can ask all of these questions. So you should really do a good investigation before you sign an agreement. And then once you sign it, you might think of it like a home. It's an asset that you're going to grow and scale and, and sell. Now, most agreements are 10 years. Some are less, some are more but I encourage people to start thinking about when they might like to sell it. And they may want to hire someone and groom that person. They may want to leave it for a family member or they may want to sell it. So as long as they have a going business, it's an asset and they can sell it. All right, okay. With, I, I, should, I should add a caveat. The franchise company of course needs to approve who they sell it to, to make sure again, they maintain certain standards and quality. But they don't they don't want to nix a, um, a sale okay okay so we're getting close to the end of another podcast here an episode here and let me just ask a couple of of wrap-up questions here what advice would you give someone who's considering franchise business opportunity or ownership the first piece of advice i'd give is to keep an open mind Many times we think of a business from a consumer standpoint. We don't necessarily walk around the table or the desk to think what would it be like to run the business, be the owner? What's the investment level? What's the return? What kind of hours? How many employees? What type of advertising and marketing is done? So I encourage people to look first within and what do they want in a business? What are their goals? Because if we're looking at a business, it's really a vehicle to get that person somewhere. So where do they want to go? Uh, is it financial? Is it lifestyle? Do they want to work with a partner? Do they want to work with adult children? And do they want to have one location or territory? Or do they want to be that empire builder and have 10 or 100? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make different recommendations based on what they tell me. But it starts first with the person. And when I talk about keeping an open mind, there are some very good businesses that aren't sexy or exciting, but great margins, great opportunity. Um, so you have to say, hmm, I never thought of this business. Let's learn about it. Let's, let's dig in and evaluate it. So we can start with a business that they might like or have some background in, but with most businesses, franchise companies want to teach you, they don't require industry experience. And even with that, many times with food, they do want you to have industry experience, but it's not so that you can flip the burger or work the drive through right. It's so that you understand the hours and what's required from staffing needs. Okay, okay. So, so if, if you're a- in the audience is interested in finding out more about franchising or learning about what franchises are out there, how can they get a hold of you? The easiest is to go to quickchatwithdiane.com and they can schedule a short call with me. They can also look at my website, dianeploys.com. That's D-I-A-N-E, P as in Peter, L-E-U-S-S -S, as in Sam, Sam. They can find me on LinkedIn, Diane Ploys, the Franchise Fitter. 
And because my last name is somewhat A, difficult to pronounce and B, difficult to spell, that's why we have Quick Check with Diane and I came up with the moniker of the franchise fitter. So other ways that you can find me. Excellent, excellent. Well, Diane, I really appreciate it. This concludes our podcast for today. And please leave a review on any of the streaming platforms you're listening to us on or go to our Charged Up Studio Facebook page and leave a review there. Charged Up Studio is a product of Marketatomy Academy, the e-learning system designed specifically with the micro business owner in mind. For more information and to register for many of our courses, go to marketatomy.academy. Diane, I really appreciate you joining us today, and I hope that uh, we're going to be able to talk again later. (laughs) I would welcome that, Danny. It has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. All right. So thank you once again, everybody listening, and go out and have a charged up week. Talk to you later. (laughs) 